So in the last lecture, we introduced totalitarianism and its principles. And so even though we, you know, we spent a good amount of time just laying down the key characteristics of how it was um, distinct compared to previous um, authoritarian governments, um, it's, it's really important because these are kind of the questions that you're going to be look, um, you're going to see on the AP test more than like what actually happened, what was this policy, um, or even you know what happened uh, in World War II um, in terms of Italy's gains. Okay, so it's not going to be as significant compared to the buildup which we want to cover in this lecture. A lot of this information is review from World History. And so um, I'm going to be kind of blasting through just the main facts because this is the stuff that you're going to be including into um, your FRQ, answering on multiple choice questions. Um, but a lot of the other details that we can go much more in depth with, I think we've done a good job in the previous uh, lecture to kind of see how this information can fit into that system. Okay. All right. So let's introduce Italy first and how it became a fascist state. Um, remember, it. Um, goes through unification in 1870 and so they have a constitutional monarchy under Victor, Victor Emmanuel III and so you know now we're in the 1900s or the 1900s um, after World War One, and Italy has kind of been evolving with you know um, the isms growing within Italy and um, at this point Italy is a more of a liberal state open for changes and reforms they're bringing in new civil rights um, and new political ideas as well Okay, um, with the Treaty of Versailles, originally because they were the victors, they were um, granted the um, territories on the Austrian border, Austrian-Hungarian border, and also on the border of the Ottoman Empire. Um, however, uh, even though they were promised these these territories, they never received them. And because they didn't receive them, um, they called these um, territories the unredeemed lands. Okay, and so. Um, at this point, from the Treaty of Versailles and the Paris Peace Conference, Italy is very upset and disappointed that uh, they were um, given empty promises that were left unfulfilled. Okay, so that frustration is building. Also, um, because of their own depression that they're going through, economic depression, um, the country begins to break out in, in riots and strikes, and then the social classes begin to have a, a lot of tension between one another. Um, there's a rise of communism and socialist ideas and many of the wealthy classes within Italy were not accepting of this and they were looking for an anti-communist leader um, to kind of rid the country of any uh, communist revolution. Okay. Um, by the 1920s we're going to see that um, the <clears throat> current government is going to have a lot of opposition where you know on one side you have socialists that are trying to take power on the other side you have conservatives that are trying to you know keep the status quo as the way it is and so because of this instability um, the political leadership in the government in the, in the constitutional monarchy was failing and because of that um, Italy is going to uh, look to perhaps a new opportunity for a right-wing conservative leader, um, because they're more accepting of the stability of what they were, what Mussolini had to offer. Okay, so um, Italy is going to be a combination of conservative authoritarianism and also totalitarianism. So they're kind of a mix of both that we mentioned last lecture. Um, they're not going to be getting to the extreme uh, levels of Russia, um, of the Soviet Union, or in Nazi Germany. Um, However, they're kind of like a hybrid because they attempt a lot of the things that the Nazis uh, would follow through with. However, they're not going to be as successful. Okay. All right, so Mussolini is our guy. Odice, the leader, and um, at heart, he was a nationalist. He had originally some socialist values that he wanted to bring to Italy. However, because people were widely you know, against, for the most part, communism, and they did not want to have... A communist leader, he began to kind of drop that. Okay, um, some of the things that he wanted to promise was expansion of territory, um, some benefits for workers, and even some land reform. However, his focus is going to change to be more about um, 
establishing Italy to be a world power once again like it was in uh, the Roman Empire okay so the fascist party um, was established by Mussolini um, it originally comes from the concept of a fascist okay so fascist is as you can see here um, these rods that are like a bundled sticks that are tied together um, this was a symbol of power during the Roman Empire um, and then you can kind of have this kind of like hand axe thing off to the side as well okay um, so it, it resembled authority and power and that's why that party was named in that way okay Mussolini is going to gain support from the conservative classes meaning the rich middle class wealthy class upper class um, because um, he was understanding that they did not want socialism uh, they saw him as a champion of law and order and so he would drop kind of those socialist values and take on a more conservative right right, right wing um, uh, type of uh, political policy okay um, in order to do so to start off with he's going to recruit some followers in the fascist party called the black shirts or the squadrisi okay so these are his recruits um, they essentially were kind of his muscle in the sense where the followers would attack and intimidate any type of political opposition communists, um, other non-fascist supporting groups, okay, anyone that's considered uh, an enemy uh, to the fascist party, they were willing to kind of physically handle them and threaten them, okay. Um, violence was just a, a common theme that we talked about, terror, okay, and so later on Hitler's going to follow through with the same example and he's going to have his own brown shirts, okay. Um, at this time, Mussolini is not really in power. However, there is a fascist party, and it really doesn't have a lot of popularity yet. However, people kind of like respect them because of their willingness to use force. Uh, then comes the major event of the March on Rome, which happens in 1922, and this is where Mussolini and his black shirts uh, march down to the capital, and uh, Mussolini demands that uh, the existing government to step down and for the king to step down um, and for him to take power. And so many fascist black shirts would follow him with that, as you can see here. Um, and the king, Victor Emmanuel, eventually granted him uh, the position of um, prime minister. And at that point, he's in charge to call the shots. Um, the government is going to give in to Mussolini's demands. He'll become a dictator. And from that point on, Mussolini is going to establish his own government. And he's going to call the shots and everything is in his hands. Okay. So one important concept you understand that will be distinct from um, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union is Italy's corporate state system. Okay, so the corporate state system was how um, Italy's economy was kind of run. Okay, so a quote to resemble to understand uh, to tie in is everything in the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. Okay, so everything is for the purpose of the state's growth, okay? Everything we do as individual citizen is for the state, right? And that, also, that is what fascism is, right? It's the glorification, right? It's the building up of the state over the individual. So the individual um, only plays a part. They have no personal significance, okay? So the corporate state is, in a sense, um, where the government is gonna be divided up into different syndicates or corporations, okay, um, meaning that the, there are these organizations or agencies, 22 exactly, where um, the government is going to organize how the business and economy will, will work. So it's very much um, state controlled, except that they kind of separate it into different sectors, okay. Um, each organization is in charge of certain parts of industry. Um, you, basically, um, Mussolini gathers together business leaders, labor union leaders, and fascist um, politicians. And from that point on, the government is going to call the shots where they're going to outlaw any strikes. Um, they're going to prevent any workers from revolting um, and demanding for better working conditions and wages. Okay, And so all of the 22 corporations are basically going to be coordinated to work between them. Um, and so the contrast to perhaps maybe like a socialist type of economy like under Stalin 
is that uh, a lot of the working class of proletariat is going to be making decisions. Okay, um, in the corporate state, there is private property allowed. Okay, profit as well is allowed, except that it's not completely capitalist. So it's it's a it's a very um, interesting mix because um, it's definitely not completely pure capitalism, right? And it's obviously not pure socialism because the working class is in control. It's really a mix between the two. Um, but because there's a dictator that is kind of setting this all up, it's it's very distinct in itself. Okay. Um, in the end, the corporate state is going to fail because it did not really address the problems of the Great Depression that has impacted Italy. Okay. And so Mussolini, in reaction, will do what most other dictators will do, is that um, he will start a, a government-sponsored public works project. Okay. Um, this is going to provide jobs and kind of stimulate the economy temporarily. However, in the long run, it's not going to work out. Um, now let's talk about under Mussolini. Okay, what does Italy um, go through um, under his dictatorship? Okay, so one thing that he takes away is really a right to vote. Okay, so um, candidates can be elected, right? But those that are chosen part of Italian parliament are already pre-selected by the fascist party. So you're kind of voting without real value, okay? And those that were already pre-selected to be put in power were obviously those that were part of the fascist party, which means that anyone that is um, laissez-faire capitalist, anyone that is supporting Marxism, anyone that's supporting democracy, axe them off, right? They, they, they don't qualify, okay? So only certain people could be already selected, which makes it useless, okay? Um, under Mussolini, okay, he's going to heavily censor the press, and he will even institute his own secret police called the OBRA. And the purpose of the secret police, as we know, is that to find out any um, those that are in opposition to the fascist government, to keep out any dissent um, from spreading. And so the government is going to not just censor the press, but set out certain decrees and mandates to regulate uh, society. Okay. So, um, schools, education is going to be regulated, okay, um, leisure time is going to be regulated of what people do, um, youth groups are going to be set up so they're being taught and indoctrinated and put into their brains, why is fascism good, why is Mussolini the greatest leader, okay, and um, even a lot of like recreational outdoor activities are going to be stimulated by the government and controlled in that way so that people are living a very kind of systematic lifestyle, um, very under very much under control of what the, the dictator is saying. Okay, um, in the end, Italian society was pretty much uh, unsuccessful because Italy never truly became completely totalitarian as a state. Uh, Mussolini never became all powerful. If you're going to see kind of his attempt of participation in World War II is going to be really insignificant compared to Nazi Germany. And so the old power of the conservatives and the military leaders and even the Catholic Church will be pretty much intact. Nothing has really changed, right? However, under Stalin, uh, under Hitler, they're going to take all these um, social classes, um, social structures, and just put them under his control, and they'll have complete control over them, right? Mussolini's not going to be successful in that way. Um, okay, let's talk about women. So this is going to be common as a fascist state, um, and being very conservative right-wing, this is really important, okay? Um, Italy, under Mussolini, is going to emphasize women to be traditional mothers, domesticated, staying at home. Um, divorce is going to be abolished for a period of time. Women are purposely there to basically take care of household duties and to have children, okay? Um, there'll be even government incentives for Mussolini um, to provide um, where uh, men are going to get better paying jobs, okay? And um, even uh, marriages are going to be promoted to have certain government uh, privileges in terms of like tax benefits and that type of stuff, okay? All right, um, so one um, policy that came out was the Lateran Pact of 1929. Uh, this was where um, Pope Pius XII and Mussolini agreed to basically acknowledge one another. And so what this did was that um, Rome, the capital, right, is 
is now going to be um, where um, the Catholic Church headquarters is, is going to be under the control of Italy as a sovereign state. However, they're going to recognize Vatican City as its own independent state. Okay, so Vatican City is within Rome, but Rome now um, is part of Italy altogether. Okay, so Pope Pius XII recognized that Italy and Mussolini is now legit. Okay, um, all right, so one last thing is um, a key characteristic that we mentioned before is two things. One is terror. Um, by instilling fear into the minds and hearts of the people, uh, people will comply. People are going to kind of accept what these policies are. They're not going to fight against it because they're afraid of getting punished. Um, I mentioned this in the last lecture. And so <clears throat> people, are, for the most part, are going to obey and follow through um, until when we see that in the end, Muslims will fail, enough is enough, okay? Um, and they will revolt against him um, after the Allies have liberated Italy, okay? Um, <clears throat> under Mussolini, he's also going to push for uh, rearmament and militarism, and just like Germany in the same way, except that Germany is going to be much more successful. Um, Mussolini's goals were ultimately that through war, he could bring Italy to its achievement and grandeur of the Roman Empire of ancient days and to reestablish that type of empire once again. Okay, all right, <clears throat> switching over to Germany now. A lot of this we've covered in world history, so I'm gonna flash through it. Um, Nazism, right, is basically extreme German nationalism, but also a mix of racism and racial superiority um, because of, we talked about the Aryan race and how uh, Hitler believes that they are uh, the more superior race, social Darwinism. Um, Hitler, okay, uh, Hitler is the leader. Adolf Hitler is going to be the leader of the National Socialist German Works Party, short for Nazi. Um, one of the main uh, motives for um, Nazism to be accepted and growing is because mainly because of the Treaty of Versailles and the bitterness that Germans um, felt because of the harsh peace that was uh, given to them, that they felt that a lot of the reparations was way too much. It really killed their economy, right? Um, a lot of the lands that they lost was um, unfair, okay? And so this is going to feed into the nation's frustration, and the Nazi party is the one that's kind of like, you know, announcing it and really feeding that into the public. Hitler's first attempt to kind of take control of government is called the Bierhauptbusch. Um, this is where um, he tried to overthrow um, the state of Bavaria's government, um, unsuccessful, right? And so he's going to be sent to jail for one year. And in that one year t term, which is very short and very lenient, um, he wrote his book, Mein Kampf, right? So Mein Kampf stands for my struggle and begins to communicate all of his ideas of what he plans to do um, when uh, the Nazis do take over and what does the German country need, right? So the German people need what they call Lebensraum. Lebensraum means living space. And um, he believes that Germany as empire will grow to a point where they can no longer sustain its empire within just its regular borders. It must go beyond that and find additional living space uh, because the Aryan race will populate and take over the world, okay? Um, so they're looking to go eastward, they go into Eastern Europe uh, to get rid of the Jews and to even take hold of the Slavic people, which is Eastern Europeans, Russians, and make them their slaves, okay? Um, there's a lot of anti-Semitic types of uh, commentary in there by Hitler, and so um, he also mentions that there's going to be a Fuhrer a leader that will have ultimate power, and that's going to be him, okay? All right, so um, Nazism is going to kind of grow in popularity because of the failure um, of the Weimar Republic. Um, because the Weimar Republic is basically kind of unstable, um, they pretty much cannot hold their country together. Unemployment has reached 43% at this point, and... Um, People have seen the, the government pretty much has, has failed to do its job. And Hitler is going to promise that uh, economically, politically, militarily, he will save the country 
He will redeem it. And people will begin to, you know, accept this, okay? Um, a lot of the big business leaders also agree that, um, yeah, I think he's the guy because our current government can't do it, right? But it sounds like Hitler has a plan and we want to give it a shot. I mean, why not? Like, we're desperate. He doesn't seem that bad. Yeah, he's really passionate, right? But we want a passionate leader anyways, okay? Um, so, um, many of the top army leaders um, agreed that, hey, you know what? The Nazis, they don't want, they don't like the Treaty of Versailles. Top army leaders also don't like the Treaty of Versailles. And so because of this, uh, they see that, hey, we are going to resist the terms of this treaty and we're going to rebuild Germany from the ground up to be a um, powerful nation once again. Okay. Um, the German youth were also in support of the Nazi party. 40% of the party was, those that supported the party, uh, was under age 30. Okay, so that's almost half. And under 40 years old was two thirds. Okay, so two thirds were under age 40. And so people were very excited. They felt like it was kind of a new way uh, of seeing their country grow and change. And so because of the desperation, um, President Hindenburg of the Roman Republic in 1930 um, says that, okay, we're going to be in this time of period of emergency because currently there's um, a huge tug of war that's going on in the Reichstag, right, between the Social Democrats and the Communists. Um, at this point, the different political parties are struggling to take control of the government. And so the Nazis eventually win the largest percentage of the votes in the Reichstag. Okay, in the 1933 elections. At this point, because the Nazi party, they have most of the votes, uh, they say, you know, Hitler's our guy, we're gonna put him in power, like he should be the leader in that point. Um, Hitler is gonna be given the position of chancellor, okay? So he's appointed by the president for this. One thing to know is that it wasn't that Hitler had a coup d'etat, he did not have an overthrowing of government himself, he was not mass elected. Yes, the Nazi party was supported by the public, but he himself was appointed by the president. Okay, so once he is in the position of chancellor, he says, "You know what? I want to bring Germany to once again um, the empire that it should be." Okay, so um, after the Holy Roman Empire and after the empire um, under Bismarck, right now we are going to see Hitler is going to be able to accomplish to some extent. Um, his goal is to set up a Third Reich, Third Empire, um, starting with the Enabling Act, 1933. So the Enabling Act was passed um, that gave Hitler absolute power for four years, unchecked power, do whatever you want, you as a dictator, you call the shots. And at this point, first thing he does, just like what Mussolini did, was only the Nazi party is the only party to exist. So just like Mussolini said, only the fascist party is going to exist. Same patterns, hand in hand, and oftentimes Mussolini and Hitler, they are allies, they're working closer together, they have pretty much the same policies, okay? How will they regulate their country? Um, Hitler will outlaw workers from striking, no labor unions, just like the fascist party in Italy, okay? Um, he's going to regulate education, universities, um, a lot of publishers and writers are going to be censored, um, books are going to be put in blacklists. And um, a lot of certain types of art is going to be prohibited because it's not glorification to the German Empire. Okay, so Nazis are going to be controlling the intellectual property uh, within their country, and uh, Hitler is going to uh, appoint Joseph Goebbels to be um, his minister of propaganda. And propaganda is a huge thing, as we talked about, as a key component to totalitarian governments because uh, by using the technology, propaganda is that much more powerful because indoctrination was necessary for a frequent inputting um, and brainwashing of people, okay? Um, so, examples of propaganda, you have Triumph of the Will, this is a documentary that was made of a Hitler youth rally, and so this was um, a film that was um, watched, right, recorded, speech was recorded, thousands were present in the stadium, right, and so this made Hitler look like really passionate, um, awesome, you know, charismatic speaker, and the Nazis are this great and wonderful political party because of this, okay? Um, also, um, Hitler's going to be appointing 
his own type of secret police called the SS or the Schulstaufen. Um, they were Hitler's elite personal guard. Um, they were responsible for um, basically executing all of the orders that Hitler would, would have. Um, they were pretty much his private army and secret police uh, under the um, leadership of Heinrich Himmler. And the Gestapo were what we call political police. So the Gestapo um, would uh, kind of be under the SS and they would work together to coordinate how to control people and to spy on any type of political dissenters, anyone that's opposing the Nazi party. And so it's eventually it's through the SS and the Gestapo that the concentration camps of the Holocaust are going to be set up. Okay. All right. Um, another part of the Reich is going to be the Hitler Jugend, okay, the Hitler Youth. Um, these are just like the youth groups that the fascist Italians had, and they are taught at a very young age, starting from like, you know, age seven, um, what German um, Aryan race as how it's superior to the Jews really is like. And so um, many of the problems that were going on in Germany were automatically blamed and pointed at um, and saying the scapegoats, the targets are going to be communists, it's going to be um, the Jews, it's going to be the homosexuals, the handicapped, they're going to be the ones that are targeted. Okay, And so what we're going to see early on is that it's going to be a progression of discrimination. Okay, Let's Keep that in mind, a progression of discrimination. Um, because you're taught at a young age, right, from seven years old, by the time you're about 20 years old, you've had 13 years of indoctrination. You pretty much have this as a core value of whatever the government's putting uh, in your face, okay? And so um, this is going to be a mandatory thing where membership is going to be required to be part of the Hitler Youth eventually. And this is, is what is, you know, as an example to be that's different from absolutism. Absolutism did not require um, participation, right? It was just more of forceful regulatory um, decrees, but at this point, totalitarianism requires obedience, requires you to comply on every level, okay? Um, it even encourages kids to turn in the parents. So if you guys remember watching Swing Kids in World History class, right? Um, students had to kind of report um, if their teachers were teaching anything that was anti-Nazi, the parents were doing things that were not for Germany, they would be reported. Okay, so the progression of discrimination is coming in, um, starting off with just kind of the propaganda, and then you have like anti-Jewish posters put up, and then we have laws put in place with the Nuremberg Laws. The Nuremberg Laws um, stated that Jews would lose their rights of citizenship. Um, Jews could not hire German women. Um, Jews were forbidden from having a national German flag. Okay, um, Jews could not use hospitals, right? Imagine that, right? They could not be educated past age 14. Um, they were not allowed to use parks, um, and many times they can't walk on sidewalks. They had lost all their privileges, okay? Um, by 1939, we're going to see 50% of Germany's Jews um, would have left Germany because they realized, hey, this is, this is dangerous, we shouldn't be sticking around. Okay, so they, they endured um, some type of discrimination, but it gets even worse. It gets even worse, okay, because eventually um, we're going to see that um, now violence is going to take place. Okay, Hitler's going to order attack on Jewish communities, so synagogues, businesses are going to be destroyed um, and, and broken into. Crystal Knox stands for the Night of the Broken Glass in 1938, and so as the progression of discrimination is continuing, right, these organized um, waves of violence are coming and homes are being destroyed and thousands of Jews are basically getting kicked out of the homes and eventually they're going to be put into these ghettos, these Jewish ghettos, so they are separated from society, um, intentionally mistreated and eventually the Holocaust will get to, to this where six million Jews in the end are going to be killed in concentration camps and labor camps in the gas chambers, all that stuff which you have learned before once upon a time. And it's not just the Jews, right? But it's also the, all the minorities that are not Aryan because that was the accepted value that the Aryan race was ultimately um, the only surviving race that should be populating itself. Everyone else should basically be killed off.
Okay. All right, here we go. Last slide. So um, Hitler became popular because of all these promises that he made, right? So if you remember the hyperinflation that was going on, what will Hitler do? Will he really be successful to live up to his words? Well, Mussolini failed to do so, but uh, Hitler was able to do so mainly because of two things. One, he put people back to work, right? So unemployment was rampant, um, but the public works program that he put out allowed Germany to get out of its economic depression. So he begins to um, require um, public housing to be built, gigantic stadiums to be built, offices, highways like the Autobahn, okay, and also the Olympics as an example, okay, was um, where um, Berlin, capital of Germany, you know, had its own stadium and its own Olympic approved facilities. And this, you know, showed that, hey, yes, uh, after World War One, Germany went through di terrible, difficult times of hyperinflation. But now, because they can host Olympics, this is showing that they are legitimately part of the international community once again, and it's kind of brought itself back on its feet. And this is where Hitler could kind of show off what he was able to accomplish. People took a lot of pride that the Olympics took place in 1936 uh, in Berlin. Okay, um, From this point, Germany also began to rearm itself. Now, this is clearly breaking and violating the Treaty of Versailles. However, by government spending okay, millions of German marks um, on its military, this you know got that economy to start up again because people are working in factories, they're making planes, they're making tanks, they're making guns, they're making trucks and cars and everything. Okay, So unemployment is going to be addressed where that will obviously decline. Um, by 1936, unemployment went from 6 million to 1 million, so it dropped immensely. Um, and <clears throat> this is going to bring people's competence much higher because they see that, hey, um, Obviously, under um, Hitler's leadership, he has fulfilled his promises, and we respect him all the more, right? My life is so much better because of him, okay? Standard of living is going to improve to some extent, right? Um, and profits of business is going to improve as well. So one thing to know is that under, um, <clears throat> under Nazi leadership and economy, uh, there is private property. He works with the middle class. He works with the upper class even in their businesses, and he puts it towards military armament mainly, okay? Um, all right, so last thing, same thing as women for uh, fascist Italy. Women are basically housewives, they're moms, they're making babies for the Reich. That's gonna be probably a question that's gonna be on the um, AP test, promoting the Aryan race, populating the Aryan race. This is something that is a core value part of Nazi ideals.